Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. On Wednesday, February 27th, 2013, a statue of Rosa Parks was unveiled in National Statuary Hall in the U.S. Capitol. The bronze statue is close to nine feet tall when resting on its heavy granite pedestal, and all in all, it weighs roughly 2,700 pounds. The statue depicts Parks seated on a rough rock-like formation. Her ankles are demurely crossed, and her hands grasp the handle of her purse, which rests in her lap. She is modestly dressed in a coat and shin-length dress, lace-up shoes, and a brimless hat on her head. The statue is supposed to represent Parks on the fateful day in December 1955, when she refused to give up her bus seat for a white passenger. The statue shows Parks looking directly forward, a stern, determined look on her face. In the words of the architect of the Capitol, the statue suggests inner strength, dignity, resolve, and determination. However, the statue also feeds into the romantic myth of Rosa Parks. The popular image of Parks is one of quiet and demure respectability. When I was in elementary school, I was taught that Parks was just a tired old woman whose feet hurt after a long day on the job. Because she was a black woman living in the South, she was relegated to the quote-unquote back of the bus on Montgomery, Alabama's public transportation. Yet that day, Parks did not move to the back of the bus. It was understood that her personal feelings and fatigue were the reasons that she did not give up her seat for a white passenger on that fateful day in December 1955, not her lifetime of being rebellious, as Parks herself liked to say about her activism. I personally was taught that Parks alone sparked the Montgomery bus boycott and that, in my schooling at least, desegregated all of the buses everywhere. There was no mention of the hundreds of other activists working for change and who made the boycott a success. Next, Martin Luther King Jr. comes along and gives a great speech about having a dream. And after that, everyone lived happily ever after. The civil rights era was over. And that's all in the past now. The end. This is an example of what scholar Vincent Gordon Harding called a, quote, massive case of amnesia. The contemporary construction of Parks is a quiet, respectable seamstress who just had enough overshadows her lifetime of social and political activism. Historian Jean Theo Harris states that this one-dimensional construction of Parks is, quote, a troubling distortion of what actually makes her fitting for such a national tribute. So today we'll discuss Rosa Parks, the mid-20th century civil rights movement in the United States, and the formation of memory. I'm Elizabeth. And I'm Avril. And we're your historians for this episode of DIG. <laughs> This episode and this entire series is, is dedicated to our friend Hallie Rubenhold and her very cool podcast, Bad Women, which you'll find over at Pushkin Media. Hallie is telling the story of the five women who were brutally murdered in the slums of London in 1888 by Jack the Ripper. Everything you thought you knew about Jack and those murdered women is wrong. Check out Bad Women wherever you get your podcasts. We have to give a special thanks and shout out to our generous Patreon supporters, too. All of y'all make what we do possible. A big shout out and thanks to our fabulous auger and excavator level patrons, Lauren, Edward, Iris, Denise, Susan, Agnes, Peggy, Colin, Maddie, and Maria. And to our two newest big time supporters, Jesse and Hannah. You're also good to us. We cannot thank you enough. Listener, if you are not yet a patron of the show, it's easy. Just go to patreon.com backslash dig podcast to learn more. Eulogies at her 2005 funeral remarked on Rosa Parks' quiet and humble attributes. 
A New York Times article memorialized her as the accidental matriarch of the civil rights movement, and almost all of the tributes and speeches focused on that singular event in Montgomery, Alabama, December 1955, when Rosa Parks would not give up her bus seat to a white man. This overshadows the lifelong span of Parks's activism, which began two decades before that fateful day in December. An intentional examination of Parks's life exposes a life history of being rebellious, as Parks herself liked to call it. Much of this episode is based on Jean Theo Harris's article, A Life History of Being Rebellious, The Radicalism of Rosa Parks. And for a deeper dive, I recommend reading Theo Harris's full book, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks was born as Rosa Louise McCauley in Tuskegee, Alabama on February 4, 1913. Rosa McCauley was raised by her mother and grandparents, all of whom instilled in Rosa a level of self-respect and racial pride. Rosa's grandfather was a strong supporter of Marcus Garvey, who inspired Garveyism, a movement of black empowerment and racial pride during the early 20th century. Rosa picked cotton as a child and attended a segregated school in Montgomery, Alabama that operated on a shortened school calendar year so that black students could be in the fields during harvest season. Montgomery did not provide a high school for black students, so Rosa attended the Laboratory High School, located on the campus of the Alabama State Teachers College, that trained African Americans as teachers. Lab High's slogan was, Study the Growth and Beauty of Nature, plants and animals for individual development, and served as an observation and teaching site for teachers in training. Unfortunately, Rosa had to drop out of school in 11th grade in order to care for her aging grandmother. She also found work as a domestic worker. Soon, she met Raymond Parks in the spring of 1931 and was impressed by his political activism. They married in December of 1932. Raymond Parks was already involved in organizing on behalf of the Scottsboro Boys, and Rosa joined him in the movement after they were married. The Scottsboro Boys were nine black teenagers who were falsely accused of raping two white women while riding freight cars during the Great Depression. The nine teens were arrested, convicted, and sentenced to death in Scottsboro, Alabama. The trials and retrials of the teens sparked an international uproar, and famously, the Communist Party of the United States supplied funds for the boys' lawyers. The case resulted in two landmark U.S. Supreme Court verdicts that eventually freed all nine teenagers, but not before they spent years suffering in the Alabama prison system. During this time, Rosa went back to school and earned her high school diploma in 1933. In 1943, Rosa Parks began attending NAACP meetings and soon became the secretary of the Montgomery, Alabama NAACP chapter and worked closely with the chapter president, E.D. Nixon. The chapter focused much of his attention on the defense of a young black serviceman accused of rape by a white woman in Montgomery. They also concentrated on registering black people to vote. In 1943, there were only 31 black people registered to vote. And I couldn't find statistics for Montgomery, like the city alone, but I did find some numbers to try to put that 31 into context. So in 1940, the state of Alabama had 2,832,961 people. uh, 983,000 of those people were black. And so considering that Montgomery is one of the three largest cities in the state, that 31 Black people registered to vote is criminally low. Oh, God. Just for context there. Yeah, that's staggering. Yeah. Between 1943 and 1945, Parks tried to register to vote on numerous occasions. She finally succeeded in registering to vote in 1945, but was forced to pay a $1.50 back poll taxes for each year that she'd been eligible to vote before election officials would let her cast a vote. To put that in perspective, $1.50 in 1945 money is roughly $23 in today's money. She was 31 years old, so $23 times 10, because the voting age in 1945 was 21, not 18, was roughly $230 in today's dollars. That's a formidable fine for a working class family to pay out of pocket, on the spot, to vote. Right. 
Beginning with the Scottsboro case, Rosa Parks spent much of her life fighting the injustices that Black people experienced in the American South. In 1944, Parks organized the Committee for Equal Justice for Mrs. Reese Taylor. Reese Taylor was a 24-year-old Black mother and sharecropper who was abducted and gang-raped by six white men when walking home from church in Abeville, Alabama on September 3, 1944. Rosa Parks, working in her capacity as the secretary of the NAACP, went to Abeville and began investigating the crime. Parks helped organize Taylor's defense by bringing together E.P. Nixon, president of the NAACP chapter and union man, who headed the Alabama Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters Union, Rufus A. Lewis, who directed a funeral home and the football team at Alabama State, and E.G. Jackson, the editor of the Alabama Tribune newspaper. Together, they formed a committee that utilized networks built through organizing for the Scottsboro case, bringing in labor unions, African-American groups, and women's clubs. Fire brands such as W.B. Du Bois, Mary Church Terrell, and Langston Hughes all helped the case rise to prominence. However, the footwork put in by Parks was what made such an alliance feasible as she met with Taylor to get her account firsthand and then spread Reese Taylor's story from rural Alabama into a campaign for justice that the Chicago Defender called, quote, the strongest campaign to be seen in a decade. The Alabama governor received thousands of letters from across the country demanding justice for Reese Taylor. The case even threatened America's efficiency in World War II as black troops were angered by the gang rape of Taylor. Charles S. Seeley, the director of the Army News, wrote to uh, Governor Sparks of Alabama and asked him to, quote, assure Negro soldiers that you will see to it that the degenerate and ruthless persons who attacked Mrs. Taylor are brought to justice and severely punished, end quote. Otherwise, he wrote, it is senseless to fight fascism abroad if fascistic influence are to be protected here at home. But even though the rape of Reese Taylor, sometimes called the Abeville Affair, became a national issue, two grand juries never brought indictments against the assailants. They were never brought to justice. However, the Reese Taylor case highlighted the power of sexual assault against black women to mobilize communities and build coalitions. According to historian Danielle McGuire, the Reese Taylor case brought the building blocks of the Montgomery bus boycott together a decade earlier and kept them in place until it became Rosa Parks' turn to testify. When that boycott took off, no one called it a woman's movement, though many observers then and since have noted the centrality of women in its ranks. Even Dr. King credited the zeitgeist when asked to comment on the strange spontaneous combustion of the bus protest. But the Montgomery bus boycott was not a prairie fire or a rising tide or a gear that tumbled into the cosmos. It was another in a series of campaigns that began when Rosa Parks rode up to Abeville in 1944 to gather the facts in the Reese Taylor case so that black women could tell their stories. Parks became the secretary of the Alabama State Branch of the NAACP during this time. She continued to travel through the state of Alabama, documenting cases of white-on-black violence, particularly sexual violence against women, in an attempt to find some legal justice. She issued press releases to Alabama newspapers to spread the word about the violence and also what she was doing. According to the O'Harris, black communities understood that, quote, Rosa will talk with you if you had something to report. Another case that Rosa Parks organized on behalf of was the case of Jeremiah Reeves, a 16-year-old black teenager who was caught by a neighbor having consensual sex with a white woman. However, once the white woman was faced with the prospect of a ruined reputation because she was having an affair with a black man, she cried rape. Reeves was arrested, convicted, and sentenced to death. From 1952 until his execution in 1958, Parks and others fought to get him off of Alabama's death row, but Reeves was executed on March 28, 1958. 
Uh, it was a tragedy that he lost his life, Park said years later. It was very difficult to keep going when all of our work seemed to be in vain. Jesus, 16. Yeah. The fight to free Reeves was the primary focus of NAACP efforts when Martin Luther King Jr., then 25, arrived in Montgomery, Alabama in 1954. King wrote about the Reeves case in his memoir, Stride Toward Freedom. He wrote, quote, in the years that he, Reeves, sat in jail, several white men in Alabama had also been charged with rape, but their accusers were Negro girls. They were seldom arrested. If arrested, they were soon released by the grand jury. None was ever brought to trial. For good reason, the Negroes of the South had learned to fear and mistrust the white man's justice. Parks continued to hone her activism. In the summer of 1955, she attended the Highlander Folk School, a training center for labor and civil rights activists in Tennessee. The Highlander School was all about trying to teach people how to be leaders of their own movements. Parks attended a two-week workshop on school desegregation, taking off of work to do so. Parks viewed the experience as a high moment, writing later, I was 42 years old, and it was one of the few times in my life up to that point when I did not feel any hostility from white people. I felt that I could express myself honestly without any repercussions or antagonistic attitudes from other people. It was hard to leave. Doing work and workshops at Highlander was a way to learn how to lead and organize people in your home community. It was very much about the kind of power an individual can hone to then lead civil rights movements uh, back in their own communities. The Highlander School was continually red baited throughout the 1950s and 1960s. In 1957, the Georgia Commission on Education attacked the school as a, quote, communist training school and featured 15 pictures of leaders of every major race incident. Five included Parks. Billboards lined southern highways that used the photo showing Martin Luther King Jr. at Highlander, the headline reading, Communist Training School, in big, bold letters. Rosa Parks is clearly visible in the photo used on the billboards as well. Nevertheless, Parks continued her support of Highlander and, quote, offering to do whatever I can for the school. By 1955, there were many instances of African Americans resisting Jim Crow segregation. In fact, by the mid-1950s, defiance of bus segregation was common. In July of 1944, Irene Morgan refused to go to the segregated section at the back of a bus traveling from Virginia to Maryland. Her case went all the way to the Supreme Court, which ruled segregation on interstate transportation was unconstitutional. In June of 1953 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, a one-day bus boycott was called because of inhumane treatment of black passengers by white drivers. Three weeks later, a longer boycott was called. It lasted seven days and resulted in a partial desegregation of city buses in Baton Rouge. In Montgomery, Alabama, organizers were already pushing back against the city's racist bus practices. On May 1, 1954, Joanne Robinson, president of the Alabama Women's Political Council, or the WPC, wrote a letter to Mayor W.A. Gale decrying the humiliations endured by black bus passengers and warned of a bus boycott if conditions did not improve. In June through July of 1954, Sarah May Fleming filed a suit against removal from a Columbia, South Carolina bus. Her case failed, but on appeal, the Fourth Federal Circuit Court ordered the city of Columbia to integrate its buses. In response, bus companies in 16 other southern cities integrated in compliance with the court ruling. However, Montgomery maintained its segregated buses, arguing that the decision only applied to Columbia. In March 1955, 15-year-old Claudette Colvin refused to move to the back of a segregated Montgomery bus. She was arrested, convicted, and fined. Parks helped raise money for Colvin's case and brought Colvin into the NAACP Youth Council. In April, Aurelia Browder refused to move to the segregated section of a Montgomery bus. She, too, was arrested, convicted, and fined. Later in October that same year, 18-year-old Mary Louise Smith of Montgomery was arrested, convicted, and fined for violating the city's bus segregation code. Several days later, Susie McDonald was arrested and fined for the same offense. 
The Montgomery NAACP wanted to bring suit against Montgomery bus segregation, but ultimately neither Colvin nor Smith was deemed the kind of plaintiff that the NAACP wanted to back for a legal case. Afterwards, a group of activists took a petition to the bus company and city officials asking for more courteous treatment and no visible signs of segregation on the buses. Uh, Rosa Parks herself refused to go with them, writing, quote, I had decided I would not go anywhere with a piece of paper in my hand asking white folks for any favors. On December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks boarded a bus on her way home from work from the Montgomery Fair Department store, where she worked as a seamstress. James Blake was the bus driver that day. Blake had treated Parks horribly on past bus rides. In 1953, Parks boarded a bus driven by Blake. She paid her fare, but then Blake told her she had to exit the bus through the front door and walk along the back side of the bus to re-enter and find her seat. She got off and did not re-enter the bus at the back. Blake drove away with her bus fare. In a 1985 interview, Parks recalled what it was like to ride the buses in Montgomery. Uh, so Parks said, and going to the back door after paying your fare in the front would mean sometimes that people wouldn't even get on the bus at all, because if you couldn't get around fast enough to suit the driver, he would just drive off and leave you standing after you paid your fare. And the interviewer asks her, now, was this a company policy? And Parks uh, says, I think it was the individual drivers because some drivers didn't do that. So on December 1st, 1955, Parks boards Blake's bus. She's actually stated that she forgot to check who was driving the bus that day. Had she noticed it was Blake, she said she would have waited for the next bus. Regardless, Parks and three other black passengers were seated in a row toward the middle of the bus. Black people were allowed to sit in this middle section, but a bus driver could tell them to move out of the middle section and into the designated Negro section if the driver decided to do so. On this day, a white man boarded the bus, but there were no more seats remaining in the white section. Since white and black people were not supposed to mix together at all in these public spaces, according to the terms of Montgomery segregation, uh, ruled that all four black passengers would have to get up so one white man could sit down in this middle section. Blake told the black passengers to give up their seats. The, uh, the three other people moved, but Parks did not. She recalled that she had not planned to protest that day, but, quote, I had been pushed as far as I could stand to be pushed. I felt that if I did stand up, it meant that I approved of the way I was being treated, and I did not approve. So often we've been taught that Rosa Parks was just a little old lady with tired feet and that she just didn't want to get up. Parks herself critiqued these popular mischaracterizations, uh, stating, quote, I didn't tell anyone my feet were hurting. It was just popular, I suppose, because they wanted to give some excuse other than the fact that I didn't want to be pushed around, end quote. Uh, but we need to be very clear how seriously dangerous this was for her to refuse to give up her seat. Like other bus drivers in Montgomery, Blake carried a gun on him when he drove, and Black people had been shot dead by bus drivers for refusing to move to segregated uh, sections of buses in the past. In 1944, Private Edward Green was killed by a bus driver in Alexandria, Louisiana, for refusing to move to the segregated section of the bus. A report by the Department of, of Defense chronicled the beating of a Black nurse in Montgomery, Alabama, on a bus during World War II. Private Booker T. Spicely was killed by a bus driver in Durham, Alabama in July 1944 for refusing to give up his seat for a white passenger. Having done a great deal of organizing around the criminal justice system, Parks was well aware of the physical dangers of a, a black woman faced in getting arrested, including the very real threat of sexual violence as well uh, as of death. Right. James Blake ordered Parks to move from her middle seat, and when she did not, he had her arrested and taken to jail. Community leaders quickly sprung into action. Edie Nixon and lawyers Fred Gray and Clifford Durr found the respectable plaintiff they had been looking for. She was 42 years old and well-respected in the community, and so she was a good face for the movement. But she also had this really long history of political activism. People knew and trusted her because she'd been active in this civil rights work for so many years. 
Nixon asked Parks to be part of a legal case against bus segregation, and she agreed. The Montgomery bus boycott itself was called by the previously mentioned Women's Political Council, which was a local group of, of black women formed to address racial inequities in the city. After hearing about Parks' arrest, Joanne Robinson, a professor of English at Alabama State College, rallied the WPC to make good on their threat to boycott the buses. Robinson, with the help of two of her students, used her department's mimeograph machine to make 50,000 leaflets that called for a boycott the following Monday. One unnamed member of the WPC later said, Joanne could have been fired from her job at the college. Most of us professors had families to support and had to be careful about being openly involved. Joanne was something else, so determined. Didn't even seem to be afraid if they found out. Ha! She used the mimeograph machines in the college to run off leaflets about the boycott. End quote. And and I'll just say uh, later, uh, Robinson was actually forced to resign because of her activism. Mimeographing? Yes. Which which for for the for for you youngins out there is like a, a copy machine copy a copy machine yes. yeah <laughs> <laughs> the fifty thousand leaflets read quote another Negro woman has been arrested if we do not do something to stop these arrests they will continue we are therefore asking every Negro to stay off the buses Monday in protest of the arrest and trial. Parks's individual action sparked a movement because the groundwork in Montgomery had already been laid. Those networks, reaching all the way back to the Reese Taylor case, sprung into action for the boycott. Those networks were what made the boycott work. And Parks later said, quote, four decades later, I am still uncomfortable with the credit given to me for starting the bus boycott. Many people do not know the whole truth. I was just one of many who fought for freedom. Edie Nixon began organizing Montgomery's black ministers to convince them to support the boycott. Two of these ministers were Ralph Abernathy and Martin Luther King Jr., who had only arrived in Montgomery a year before, but was already enmeshed with the activist networks because of his work for Jeremiah Reeves. Come Monday, nearly every black person in Montgomery stayed off the bus. Later that evening, a crowd of 15,000 people gathered at the Holt Street Baptist Church for a meeting. Collectively, they decided to continue the boycott until the buses were no longer segregated, and they also formed the Montgomery Improvement Association. In order to get people around town during the boycott, the churches uh, bought or rented cars and station wagons to transport people. Um, also, individuals uh, donated and used their cars to kind of act as as taxis. To raise money to support the boycott, uh, Georgia Gilmore, a cook and domestic worker, organized the Club from Nowhere, which she ingeniously named to avoid compromising white as well as black patrons. According to one participant, the club went door to door asking for donations and selling dinner plates and baked goods. They made weekly reports on all of the money collected from all kinds of people, blacks and whites. Some of these people didn't want it known that they had given money to the movement, so they wouldn't give Mrs. Gilmore and the other ladies checks that could be traced, only cash. And Mrs. Gilmore made sure they didn't tell anyone who had made the donations. That's why it was called the Club from Nowhere, so that none of the people giving the money could be in the least bit accused of supporting the movement. On December 8, 1955, MIA leaders tried to negotiate with Montgomery Mayor W.A. Gale and representatives of the bus companies. The MIA's demands included the courteous treatment of black passengers, seating on a first-come, first-served basis with blacks filling the bus from the rear and whites from the front, and no reserved seats, and hiring of black drivers on predominantly black routes. However, the, the city stood firm in its commitment to bus segregation, and so people continued to walk into carpool. In fact, it took a massive amount of work to organize and keep the boycott going. Many women worked as dispatchers, calling cabs and organizing carpools to get the city's black residents to work and to the bank and shopping and all of the other places that people need to go on a daily basis. Boycotters were continually harassed and membership in the segregationist White Citizens Council doubled. 
Montgomery's mayor and police commissioner added themselves to the number, while other segregationists began a program of intimidation and violence against the city's black citizens. The city government revoked licenses from taxi drivers who lowered rates for boycotters, ticketed automobiles carrying them to work, forbade carpools to pick up passengers on public property, and tried unsuccessfully to disrupt the boycott by broadcasting false information about its resolution. Kings, Nixons, Abernathy, and Robert Gretz's houses were even bombed, but luckily none of their families were hurt. After eight days of investigation, a grand jury found that 89 protesters had violated an anti-boycott law adopted in 1921 to prevent labor organizing. The indictments named Rosa Parks, MLK, Joanne Robinson, and many other prominent black citizens. 28 witnesses were called to testify to the abusive treatment that they had to endure by bus drivers. King was found guilty and ordered to pay a $500 fine and 386 days of hard labor. He was released on bond. Parks refused to pay the $14 fine imposed for her December 1st, 1955 violation. And on February 22nd, 1956, she was sentenced to 14 days in jail, but appealed to the state Supreme Court and was released on bond. She was also arrested on the anti-boycott charge, fingerprinted under the eyes and cameras of the press and indicted. Nevertheless, Parks continued to give speeches on behalf of the NAACP and MIA, attend meetings and organize the NAACP youth program, help distribute clothes and food, and serve as a dispatcher for the boycott. Yet Parks' brave action was taking a toll on her financial stability. Montgomery Fair, the, the department store where Parks worked as a seamstress, let Parks go. A week later, Raymond Parks resigned his job at a barbershop on Maxwell Air Force Base because his employer prohibited any discussion of the boycott or Rosa Parks in the shop. As a political activist, this was unacceptable for Raymond Parks. So basically, one month into the boycott, neither Rosa nor Raymond had jobs anymore and were never able to find stable work in Montgomery. Additionally, their landlord raised their rent $10 a month. The Parks home received death threats and regular hate mail. Remember, LLK's and Nixon's houses had already been bombed, so it was feasible that the Parks home could be bombed as well. The stress took a physical toll on Rosa, Raymond, and her mother who lived with them. Parks developed physical ailments due to the stress as well. Yet she continued to play an active role in coordinating the boycott. Lawyer Fred Gray wanted Rosa Parks to be lead plaintiff in his federal case, but her December conviction was still pending in the Alabama appeals court and could not be heard in a federal court until the state had acted. To wait might have postponed the case indefinitely. Therefore, the NAACP Legal Fund filed a federal civil action lawsuit with Aurelia Browder, Susie McDonald, Mary Louise Smith, and Janetta Reese as the plaintiffs who had been discriminated against uh, by bus drivers. And the case was Browder v. Gale, Gale being the, the mayor of Montgomery. On June 4, 1956, the federal district court decided that the Montgomery segregation law violated the due process and equal protection clauses of the 14th Amendment. The case was appealed to the Supreme Court. On November 13, 1956, the Supreme Court ruled the segregation of buses unconstitutional, but the boycott continued for another month until the order reached Montgomery. The city issued an ordinance authorizing passengers to sit anywhere they chose on the bus. With the Supreme Court's ruling in Browder v. Gale, the 381-day boycott ended. On December 20, 1956, the day the buses were desegregated in Montgomery, nearly all the media ignored Parks in favor of quotes from pictures of Martin Luther King Jr., Glenn Smiley, Edie Nixon, Ralph Abernathy, and Martin Luther King Jr. boarded the first desegregated bus in the city. It was Look Magazine that staged the photo of Rosa Parks sitting in the front seat looking out the window that would come to be uh, an iconic photograph. Unfortunately, court decisions did not end public hostility or segregation. 
During and immediately after the boycott, in addition to the bombings already mentioned, four black churches were bombed, snipers fired at buses, shots were fired at MLK's home. It took 10 more years before Montgomery fully desegregated its schools and other public areas. The Parks family continued to struggle financially, faced violent threats on a daily basis, and because of Parks's public image as the quote-unquote mother of the movement, some people in the civil rights movement began to express resentment towards her. In August of 1957, the Parks family, including Rose's mother, moved to Detroit, Michigan. Parks called Detroit, quote, the northern promised land that wasn't. Parks saw that racism in Detroit was almost as widespread as in Montgomery. The Parks family still struggled financially, and Rosa and Raymond had a hard time finding steady work. Rosa eventually found a seamstress job at a small shop in Detroit, and for seven years, 1958 to 65, worked while accepting invitations to speak around the country and receiving awards, including honorary membership in the recently formed Southern Christian Leadership Conference. However, her extraordinary renown did not benefit her family financially. In 1963, she joined Martin Luther King at the front of Detroit's Great March to Freedom, held weeks before the March on Washington. In 1964, she volunteered for John Conyers' political campaign, a young upstart civil rights lawyer who ran on a jobs, justice, and peace platform. Conyers, like Parks, was an early opponent of the war in Vietnam and was very pro-labor. Parks convinced Martin Luther King Jr. to come to Detroit on Conyers' behalf. Largely because of King's support, Conyers won the election. From then on, Parks worked for him as a secretary and receptionist. Parks also continued her activism and maintained a busy travel schedule where she made appearances and gave speeches at numerous events. In February 1965, a night demonstration for voting rights at the Marion, Alabama courthouse turned violent. State troopers clubbed marchers and beat and shot a 26-year-old African-American man named Jimmy Lee Jackson, who later died. Jackson had been trying to register to vote. His death spurred the fight for civil rights in Selma, Alabama. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC, scheduled a protest march. On March 7, 1965, the nation watched as protesters attempted to march from Selma, Alabama to Montgomery to bring awareness to the disenfranchisement of most of the millions of African Americans across the South. At the Edmund Pettus Bridge, marchers were met with a wall of state troopers and county posse men. Earlier, the county sheriff had issued an order for all white men in the county over the age of 21 to report to the courthouse that morning to be deputized. Governor George Wallace had told law enforcement to, quote, use whatever means necessary to prevent a march. Law enforcement attacked the unarmed marchers with tear gas and nightsticks. Images of marchers left beaten and bloodied were televised to a national and international audience, which raised support for the Selma voting rights campaign. One of the organizers of the march, Amelia Boynton, was beaten unconscious. A photo of her lying on the road of the Edmund Pettus Bridge appeared on the front page of newspapers and news magazines around the world. John Lewis of SNCC, who later became a House representative for Georgia's 5th Congressional District, suffered a skull fracture and bore scars on his head from the incident for the rest of his life. In all, 17 marchers were hospitalized and 50 treated for lesser injuries. The day soon became known as Bloody Sunday within the Black community. After the march, President Johnson issued an immediate statement deploring the brutality with which a number of Negro citizens of Alabama were treated. He also promised to send a voting rights bill to Congress. Two days after Bloody Sunday, 2,500 marchers walked out onto the Edmund Pettus Bridge, held a short prayer session, and, led by Martin Luther King Jr., turned around and headed back the way they came. That night, four KKK members beat three white Unitarian Universalist ministers who were in Selma for the march. One, Reverend James Reeb from Boston, died in the hospital from his wounds. Organizers of the Selma voting rights campaign issued a call for citizens from across the country to join them. Rosa Parks heard the call and returned to Alabama to join the marches. 
However, according to Theo Harris, many of the younger organizers did not know her, and because she was not given an official jacket, the police kept pulling her out and making her stand on the sidelines. However, a number of the whites in the crowd did recognize her, yelling, You'll get yours, Rosa! Another woman who heeded the call to come to Alabama was Detroit activist Viola Liozzo, a white mother of five, part-time student, and member of the NAACP. She contacted the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, who took her on and tasked her with delivering aid to various locations, welcoming and recruiting volunteers, and transporting volunteers and marchers to and from airports, bus terminals, and train stations, for which she volunteered the use of her car, a 1963 Oldsmobile. After the third march concluded on March 25th, Liozo, assisted by Leroy Moten, a 19-year-old African-American, was killed by members of the Klan, including an FBI informant, as she drove marchers home. Upon returning to Detroit, Parks was incensed to hear of her fellow Detroiters' murder and fueled her activism in the Women's Public Affairs Committee in Detroit. Parks' activism continued throughout the rest of her life. During the 1960s, she saw no conflict in her admiration for leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. She read all about X's politics and said he, quote, reminded me of somewhat of my grandfather. He was full of conviction and pride in his race. The way he stood up and voiced himself showed that he was a man to be respected. Parks even told an interviewer that although she understood the calculated advantages of nonviolence as a political tactic, she admitted that it was, quote, hard to say that she was completely converted to it, saying that as far back as I remember, I could never think in terms of accepting physical abuse without some form of retaliation if possible, end quote. In fact, after riots in Detroit that followed a police raid at a Black-owned bar resulted in death and destruction, Parks did not view the rioters' protests as that much different than her own. She said, quote, I would associate the activity of the burning and looting and so on with what I had done and would have done. I guess for whatever reasons it came about, I felt that something had to be wrong with the system. Parks wasn't the docile seamstress that she was portrayed as, but as a woman staring injustices square in the face. Continuing in her commitment to to criminal justice issues that she began with back with the Reese Taylor case, Parks organized on behalf of Joanne Little in the 1970s. Joanne was charged with murder when she defended herself against the sexual assault of her jailer, Clarence Oligood, by killing him with an ice pick and escaping from her jail cell. The Detroit branch of the Joan Little Legal Defense Committee made it clear that women, no matter the circumstances, had the right to defend themselves against sexual violence. Parks also worked to free Gary Tyler, a 16-year-old black teenager who was wrongfully convicted of killing a 13-year-old white boy. In 1974, Destrehan High School in St. Charles Parish, Louisiana, was desegregating its schools. Did you catch that date? We're talking about 1974, 20 years after Brown v. Board. Uh, So in this desegregation, quote unquote, attempt, black students were bused to the school to try to achieve desegregation. Um, One day upon leaving the school to go home, the bus carrying the black children was ambushed by a mob of roughly 200 white people. A 13-year-old boy standing in the mob was shot and killed. Police boarded the bus and pulled Tyler off for allegedly shooting the white boy outside of the bus, even though no gun was found on the bus. Rosa Parks organized activists in Detroit on behalf of Gary Tyler and gave the keynote address at a packed meeting in Detroit in June of 1976. Tyler, who was initially given the death penalty, but had his sentence commuted to life in prison in 1977, was not freed from jail until 2016, even though human rights organizations had been advocating for him for years. In 1987, Rosa Parks Parks founded the Rosa and Raymond Parks Institute for Self-Development, which in a way was like an urban Highlander school. 
The Institute strove to build leadership among Detroit's young people, teach black history, and engage young people in the struggle for civil rights. In 1999, Parks received a Congressional Gold Medal, and even before her death, began to be lauded as a saint-like figure. Her biographer, Douglas Brinkley, wrote, quote, Now that Rosa Parks' body was too feeble to march and her voice had faded to a whisper, politicians lauded her as a patriotic icon. She had grown safe to exalt. Upon her death in 2005, politicians from both sides of the aisle raced to honor Parks. Not as a radical activist, but as a quiet but proud woman who did one brave act in the past. Theo Harris says it best, quote, Stripping Rosa Parks of her radicalism while celebrating her as the mother of the civil rights movement became part of a larger move to de-radicalize the legacy of the movement itself. While many of the eulogies sought to put Parks' protests firmly in the past, Parks herself had continued to insist on the persistent need for racial justice and the present. And this is a phenomenon that scholar Vincent Gordon Harding explored in relation to our collective memory about MLK as well. Um, Essentially how MLK has been shrunk down to a man with a dream, someone who advocated for a problem that's, you know, now in our past, right? Uh, And even Rosa Parks pushed back on MLK's memorialization while she was still alive, stating that MLK, uh, quote, was more than a dreamer. He was an activist who believed in acting as well as speaking out against oppression. Uh, Poet Carl Wendell Hines wrote a poem about MLK's memorialization that so encapsulates this. And so I think that we have to read it in its entirety. And so here's the poem. Now that he is safely dead, let us praise him, build monuments to his glory, sing hosannas to his name. Dead men make such convenient heroes. They cannot rise to challenge the images we would fashion from their lives. And besides, it is easier to build monuments than to make a better world. And so it's at this point uh, in my general Uh, you know, American history survey in my classes where I will actually show my students the image of the bronze statue in Statuary Hall at the Capitol. Um, And then I put the image side by side with Parks's mugshot from her arrest, where she's looking quite differently. Um, And to me, and of course, this is this is my opinion. She looks like a real person in her mugshot. She's got a slight grin on her lips, and she looks directly into the camera, almost daring, uh, you know, saying, like, I dare you to break me, right? And she looks like someone that I want to know, like she's got a spark to her. Uh, And so the mugshot juxtaposed against the statue in the Capitol that, again, in my opinion, makes her look like a little old lady. Like, yes, the, the, the face on the statue looks proud, but it, it doesn't look like the, 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 the radical Rosa Parks, right? It looks like this uh, mythologized, romanticized version of what she is. Um, and so I like to put these two pictures side by side to kind of talk to my students uh, uh, all about the ways that our collective memory um, is formed at that, and that flattens this really interesting woman into kind of a safe and a simple icon. As this is evidencing, she's not that that old lady statue. She, right. And I mean, even even then, she, 42 is not uh, old. Well, I tell my students, I'm like, okay, so I'm 42. So if anybody right. wants to like <laughs> say that I'm a little old lady, like her and I, Rosa Parks and I are now exactly the same age at that point in her life. So we'll have some more. And we'll show you just how well a 42-year-old lady can fight. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And and so and so I've alluded to this uh, uh, Harding article as well. And 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 his article uh, is kind of the same idea. The article is called Beyond Amnesia, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Future of America. Um, And again, kind of discussing the same kind of thing, this 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 de-radicalizing of a civil rights hero. Right. Making them very safe to exalt, as Brinkley says Mm -hmm. about Parks, Um, you know, taking away their radicalism and. 
and remembering them as, you know, these nonviolent, very safe black people that were doing protests in a quote unquote the proper way, right? So nowadays you'll hear all the time, oh, well, if, you know, people weren't in the streets and this, that, and the other, they're not protesting the right way. Like that's BS, right? And and just mm-hmm. as in the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s, um, you know, they were radical. I mean, we have to remember that MLK himself, I think he had like a 70% disapproval rating in a Gallup poll um, at kind of the height of his uh uh, being famous, right? And so mm-hmm. we tend to memorialize these people in this very safe way. And now, you know, people from both politicians from both sides of the aisle can exalt them when, you know, in actuality, they were public enemy number one um, at, at right. their time. And and we need to right. recognize and remember that when we're talking about this type of history. Yeah. And it's, I think it's also super interesting, like, which of the civil rights leaders and activists get memorialized in that way too, right? Um, who, 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 I don't know, white people and, and historians, et cetera, American politicians and public intellectuals can sort of clean up their image and then package them in these neat little um, stories of perseverance and the end of Mm -hmm. racism in america um and then you get like the fred hamptons where you know he's he's a guy who the fbi or cia cia fbi literally assassinated in his home um who you never learn about right you never learn about until you go and watch the movie and right? until you're in my history class we actually just right until you're yeah, in we college just, we just yeah. got to watch uh black panthers vanguard of the revolution last week in our class it was Ooh. lovely and all the students enjoyed it so. good yes. yeah and that's, and that's but you have you shouldn't have to wait till college to get that information yeah, no i hear what you're saying it's the it's the whole it's the whole it's story this, right? it's the and, creation yeah. of memory and, and, yes. and mythologizing yeah. a movement that is supposed to be in the past. And mythologizing what America means. Amen. Amen. Yeah. All righty. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us uh, for our podcast today. We really appreciate your five-star reviews on whatever podcast app you choose to listen to us on. Yeah, for sure. And be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter at dig underscore history, as well as Instagram. If you're looking to uh, do a little Christmas holiday, New Year 2022 shopping, because you want to look your best for a new year, you can visit our epic dig swag store, um, T Public. Uh, that's you can find that through our website digpodcast.org and teachers we've got a whole section of our website that's dedicated to resources for educators so ideas for how to use the podcast in the classroom more broadly specific ex- assignments uh, examples linked linking to particular episodes lots of ideas to help you incorporate your favorite history podcast into your classroom and, and where find the link to this go ahead sorry oh no. And no. we're working on that all the time. So if you visit it in the past and you didn't see something, check back often because we're constantly updating the educa- educators yes. section. Yeah. Beefing it up. So you'll find the link to our swag store, the resources for educator page, as well as transcripts and bibliographies for all of our episodes at digpodcast.org. Bye. Bye. <laughs> This podcast was produced by the historians of DIG, Elizabeth garner Masaryk, Sarah Hanley-Cousins, Marissa Rhodes, and me, Avril Earls. Thanks for listening. The statue shows Parks looking directly forward, a stern, determined look on her face. Oh, whoa, 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 hold on. I made some changes. Shoot. And they're not coming up on yours, are they? Let me refresh real quick. While you were gone, I kind of updated. Did, did, that, uh, did that change at all? Uh, that no, second paragraph for you? There's a, the end of the sentence is not full. Uh, I'm gonna um, put it all into into a Google Doc so we can change it. Word I didn't realize that that was a. Um... Is that that guy's name? I don't know. There you go. To to Mayor, it's Chauncey. Oh. Should I just read the whole thing again? 
Yeah. No, I just put so. it in there for like. You oh, want okay. to? Okay, okay. okay. Nah, that's fine. Go ahead. I know. You know. Okay. I'm just gonna quickly um, find and replace my name. Mistake. Oh, I think the first couple are just one L. Yep. So now some of them have three L's. That's even better. <laughs> I roll. <laughs> Leo. Le Leozo. Lewis McCauley in Tuskegee, Alabama. I think on that February should be Louise, probably. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> well, she could have been named after her dad. We don't know.